Welcome to the Waiting List Podcast. Tell us a story. It's like many things you start building from, from scratch. And then I'm like, wait, I really do like watches because... You, you've seen so many watches that makes you I, excited. Yeah, I think I really, really do like watches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's a great way to see if you are a watch enthusiast. All right, welcome everyone to another episode of the Waiting List Podcast. And today we have Nicholas, who comes from a family that historically have made uh, straps. Welcome, Nicholas. Hi, thank you for Hi. having me. All right, his Later. family name is Hirsch. So I guess it's not going to take many of you to work out that Hirsch Straps is his family business. For me, it actually took me a few months to work out, but <laughs> 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 that's because I'm a little bit slower than everybody else. But <laughs> That is true. Right. As usual, I am accompanied today by Soup Finance Finance. Thanks. Aka Long Long and Alex James Bond Lau. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> You're... you got to find a new name tag for that. You're just getting dry. Yeah, up. because now exactly. a lot of these girls are just going to be looking for Alex's uh, account yeah. and then they're going to be completely disappointed. Fine. That's completely fine. No. By the way, in the last podcast, I said you, because you weren't here, I said you went auditioning in Taiwan Studios. <laughs> so <laughs> did you get the part? You know, because they're auditioning for the new James Bond. Yeah. I thought they finished filming. What are you talking about? No, they're auditioning for the new James Bond. Daniel Craig isn't going to be James Bond anymore. Isn't he? Oh. 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 You oh. signed, oh. signed a oh, sorry. confidentiality oh. agreement. No. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, speaking of which, no, anyway, let's get back to the topic. Anyway. No, no, go on. No, I was just saying, who would you say would be like the best replacement? Well, there's player? two people that they're looking at. They're looking at Who's that? Um, Tom Hardy. Mm. and Henry Cable. Yes, please. Oh, you mean Superman? Yeah, Henry, Ga like, long just wants to see Henry Cable take his top off. Yeah, <laughs> he, his body is really, like, yeah, it's good. I think in his prime, I would say the one that should have been was Christian Bale. But anyway, he would have been uh, quite cool James yeah, Bond in yeah. his prime. Yeah, anyway. He was, he, was a good, he was a good Batman. Yeah. Anyway, he was, yeah. Right, anyway, I believe we've had a lot of watch or so-called watch experts uh, on this channel. But really, it's the first time that we have a watch strap expert on. And you can actually say that because it's actually your business, right? <laughs> for, for many generations yeah, true, yeah. as well. So it's the first time we have a watch strap person on. So I'm very interested to get into this. So, right, so let's do this. So just so the audience can identify with you a little bit better, do you mind telling us where you were born and where you were brought up? A bit, maybe a bit of your family, so people just have an idea. Okay, so um, I I was born in Austria, um, but at the time my dad was doing a lot of business in Asia and he was um, uh, creating the company there and building everything up. So at the age of two or two and a half, I moved to Hong Kong and um, lived there for seven years. Wow. Then came back to Austria, uh, went to school there, went to high school, um, university, and uh, every, every summer actually spent working somewhere in a different country and traveling with our uh, sales people. And um, after studying in Vienna, I stayed in Vienna and yeah, now I'm in Vienna. <laughs> okay, great. So um, can we just figure out for people listening, how old are you? Ah, oh, yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, I'm 29, turning 30 this year. Yeah, oh, I mm. literally was like, okay, not just saying this, because we're doing this on Zoom, right, for people listening. I was like, do I ask, is he 21, 22? <laughs> oh, man. All right. No. So you're cool. saying he looks young? Yeah, he looks really young. Yeah, he does look young. Thank right? you. Yeah. Right. So, you know your family business, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody probably knows about your straps do you guys know about his straps yeah did you yeah you know right Alex, yeah you know? i just never yeah. figured out all the time yeah okay so you're as equally as slow as me yeah i knew uh, it was coming <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's when we're friends <laughs> how, 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 share the news yeah. how, how how big is the company how many employees are there and roughly you know if you don't mind sharing what's your annual turnover so mm -hmm. basically just talk about the family business yeah so um, we have we have 800 people worldwide. We have 
400 and a couple in <clears throat> in Austria. So one of our one of uh, our main production facility and our main headquarter is in Austria in the south. And um, we've made in 2018 we had uh, 75 million euros in turnover, approximately. That's impressive for straps. Like I wouldn't even think those figures. Exactly. Yeah. I was gonna say right. I remember when he told me because I did a little interview with him privately just so I could get to know Nicholas a li little bit better. Mm -hmm. And he told me those figures. I don't know. I went to tell. I was like, "What? <laughs> like, what the hell? That's yeah. like more than some watch brands, right?" Yeah. And then um, I spoke to somebody else about it, and they were equally as shocked. And they were like, "They were like quoting ridiculous numbers, like." I know, five million, seven million. Yeah, I would have thought that too. Damn. Uh, does your market come from, let's say, third party, or you're doing OEM for the companies? So what we do is we have like the we have three business fields that were um, created um, over time. So the the um uh, the first thing we did when my great grandfather founded the company um, was that we had our own brand. So the Hirsch brand, basically, this is something our straps are sold in over 80 countries. And we have thousands of um, point of sales and dealers all over the world. And then the second thing we do is we work in the OEM business. So we work with uh, watch brands and other brands as well in creating products for them, mainly out of leather and caoutchouc and these kinds of things. And then we have a third business which is um, in the UK, in Switzerland, and in Spain, where we do watch repair as well. So we have our own mm -hmm. shops where we repair watches and do cleaning and these kinds of things. Okay. Um, how did your great, this is your great grandfather, right? Yeah. How did he get into it? So um, we have a long history in the family working with leather. So I think, uh, or um, the, the, the first certificate or the documentation was from 1765, mm -hmm. where one of my ancestors, he was certified um, leather craftsman. Um, and we, we, we created leather. We had tannery in Austria as well, and these kinds of things. And um, my great grandfather was, um, uh, he lived in near Vienna. Um, and after the World War, he, he, he and his wife moved to the south of Austria to, to a small city. And he started because he had to do something and he was a very creative man. Um, he, he, uh, so he started collecting the scraps of the shoe industry. Mm -hmm. So he collected some leather and out of that he started making uh, watch straps. So, I, I recognize because um, I, I think it is uh, during the war, there's a lot of uh, bootmakers and shoemakers yeah. uh, around that area. Uh, I think one of the most notable ones is St. Crispin's. I think they're quite a big company, quite close by, right? I actually never Va heard of Voss. Them, but How about Voss? V A S S? Yeah, that could, I think yeah, these, are, yeah, yeah. these are quite big, relatively big companies. So, you kind of got like the scrap, met uh, scrap leather from those companies and started making leather from that leather straps from that exactly yeah so uh, austria, exactly and, so yeah, austria sorry. is uh i didn't know that austria was even known for leather it, it actually isn't that much but no. um we we as alex already said we had a lot of um shoemakers and mm. there are still a lot um here and we have a very um uh, we're very famous for, for, for our mountains and, and the whole um, aspect of living in the mountains and doing activities there. So there are a lot of um, brands here and in the area around Switzerland and Germany where they produce products. Um, cool. And that's why there's a lot of leather as well. Very cool. So did he go literally straight to the watch industry after making these straps and say, do you want them? Or like, because, Austria is not really famous for watches either, right? No. Um, what he did is, so the first thing he did is he went to his local dealers and sold them the, the straps he made. 
Um, and um, when like a watch my, dealers. Yeah, yeah. What? No, yeah, not only the um, yeah watch dealers. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, and um, and jewelers and and these and these shops everywhere where the consumer mm. has to go with his watches and 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 these kinds of things. And then when my grandfather took over the business or joined the business, he was basically responsible for the expansion. And he started um, networking a lot, getting to know the people from the watch industry, and then everything with the OEM business came. So who was the biggest kickoff, like the company that he worked with um, that kind of sealed and helped his company grow? Because normally so, there is a big stepping point. Yeah. Um, I'm, it's unfortunate, but I, I cannot talk about specific brands. Mm. Um, but Relax. We, can you give us a hint? Can you give us a hint? Like hint, hint. <laughs> <laughs> so in the past, we, we, one of the biggest brands um, or one of the biggest projects we, we've, did, we've done was um, creating um, straps made out of a, um, a uh, a plastic material or a, a synthetic material, um, especially for um, a rather cheaper but very very well known brand. So I don't know if that helps, but yeah. Um, <laughs> well, and guess I so. guess everyone, everyone, every one of you might have one of the these. Can types we do of this? Oh, okay, okay, okay. 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 Can we say yeah. a brand? You name, nod, three of and then you nod. No, no, you have to nod. Yeah. But you can say one of you got it right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I say right, swatch. You start then. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Th that's it then. You got it right. Oh, thanks, <laughs> Alex. Just no, tell no, the no, whole no, world. No, 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 no. We no, have I mean, to. We have no. to. We have to say two more. I'm gonna say. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna say Seiko. Uh, Tiso. I'll say Seiko. Um, one of you got it right. All right. Oh. Okay. I wonder who got that. So does that mean because your um grandfather was networking and like building these relationships, right? Does that mean that you have access to all the watches that you want <laughs> and you can no. ask for anything <laughs> no I'm, i mean it would be cool but i i think it would destroy a little bit of the magic of the watch industry if you could have everything yeah, that um, is true have an easy access no we don't we don't have that um we do have a good relation and that's and that's something we cherish very very much and um, it's part of what i'm responsible now to do mm -hmm. um and yeah so if you're making um, uh, plastic straps as well, as well as the leather straps, because I, you know, I think when most people hear that straps, they, they automatically think leather. Are you making the bracelets as well? Like so we, we don't do metal. Right. Um, but um, so that project is not ongoing anymore. It was a very big project for a, a certain amount of time. And we've developed the um, technology um, um, together with the company. Um, but what we also do is we work a lot with caoutchouc. So uh, rubber, basically, very high quality rubber. And um, we fuse materials with each other. So it's mainly rubber and leather, but also other high tech materials or even natural materials like wood, for example. Well, I've got two questions because there, there are certain um, countries that doesn't allow, let's say, fresh, oh, other exotic mm -hmm. materials like lizard or alligator. Number one, how do you get past that? And secondly, mm -hmm. have you discovered that there's a new trend of people who don't want um, leather anymore? They're a little bit more conscious and these kind of green and vegan uh, perspective of trying to use other materials other than leather, for example. Okay, so you're back right now. I didn't hear the second no. question. Okay, um, so the first one, like I mentioned, was how do you find transferring exotic leathers across the world? Yeah. And the second one is have you discovered that the market is starting to shift to from vegan to green straps rather than using leather? Yeah, so um, we are very, very in, in, in sync with what the... Um, watch industry wants or needs and if um, so we see a very high decline for example in materials like sharks or mm. um, snakes and these kinds of things so we don't do these anymore um, out of ethical reasons of course as well but um, also because 
it there's no real um, market demand for it. That. Yeah. Yeah. And to be the honest. other types. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. Finish. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is, we are we are, we are very well known for our quality and our innovation power. So what we tend to do is we always create products and materials um, that are ahead of time. So what we do is, of course, we look at the trends in in terms of vegan and and, and natural materials. But there's there's still a discrepancy between recycled materials and real sustainable materials actually. And so what we want to do is we want to create something um, that is actually sustainable and not just recycled. Yeah, I agree. I think a a lot of the marketing, like say with clothes and stuff, just because it says it's like recycled, doesn't they actually use up a lot of energy and and create more waste like recycling. Um, Okay. So the thing about sharks, right. Um, how does it actually work? Because I feel like Chinese people take the fin and we eat it, right? But then the actual <laughs> shark, people are eating the meat, right? It doesn't go to waste, right? They don't just dump the shark back into the sea, right? I think they do, actually. Like when they I think the they still dumping, do. Yeah, they cut the fin off and they chuck the carcass back in. And then, then you have to just source for the... I, I'm pretty sure people eat shark meat. I, I mean, I've eaten shark meat before, but I think, well... I'm just quoting from like videos I've seen, mm-hmm. um, those documentary videos, they just cut the fin off and then they chuck the carcass back in. I think it's for some, I don't know, some, some legislation. They can't use the body or something like that. Uh, All right. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. But the immature side of me, which is quite a large part of me. Um, 99.9%. Yes, very, very, very immature side of me. Because you're not willing to say the brands, I feel like I want to keep poking you. So, <laughs> so but not, not that you have to say any brands, but I just feel I've got more questions on the brands. Right? Mm-hmm. So you don't start to say, but if you said the watch industry as a whole, how much percentage does your company make straps for? That's a very, very hard question to answer. Not, not just because I cannot tell you, but I actually don't know the real percentage because there are many other um, strap makers that work with the watch industry and we're part of it. Um, and if you take numbers of certain brands, it's a huge market. So I don't actually know the real market share, to be honest. Oh, okay. Uh, another question. Um, there's a, a famous uh, electronic watch made by a company that represents a fruit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I think they have a lot of plastic straps too. <laughs> Would you happen to be making any straps for them? No. Oh, okay. You, <laughs> is that no, I'm not answering? Or, no, we no, no, no. No, we're, we're not doing anything for them. So, I mean, do they make it themselves? I actually don't know, but I don't think so. I, I think as with their electronic devices, they have someone doing it for them. Man, if you got that order, that would be huge. Yeah, but it's also a big responsibility because they have, um, I mean, a brand like the one you've just mentioned or the, the one you company, did not yeah. mention, the food company, yeah. Um, they have like these rules and regulations that you have to follow. So they're very, very tight in, in, in these kinds of terms. So it's not that easy. So an know. example would be like, you know, MS working with that particular fruit mm-hmm. company. How do they mm-hmm. manage to get the deal, for example? I think it's a lot about branding. And mm-hmm. I think that especially um, if you take Hermes, it's it's known for for their quality and their leather not like other brands are known for something different but they have a specific um branding to 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 this type of material so i so i guess it's because of that so with that brand because i think ms have access to the best leathers i'm not sure that's a myth or if it's true but they use like grade a top grain whereas when you mentioned the shoemakers i know that they don't use that level of leather um, simply because I know those brands. So is, is it better to have like a soft lever like that for the watch or is it better to have a hard wearing one? That's a, that's a very, very good question. And um, I love that you just 
ask that because it, there's a big misconception around leather basically uh, in the okay. watch industry. I mean, um, for for many people, or it, it's actually true in 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 some points, but um, what most of the brand, um, what most of the cheaper um, strap makers use or the most straps um, the cheaper straps are made up of is like um, a mix of leather it's not it's leather but it's not like um, full grain and the higher quality um, straps are made from full grain leather so it's it has a specific it's the top layer basically of the leather if you take my jacket for example this is not the top grain it's it, it, you see the pores and everything um and it, it's just a, a layer beneath um and in that so sense you, yeah to please. clarify you so you've got full grain top grain then there's another grade then the one below that is kind of called genuine leather is that right yeah exactly exactly what's the, what's, what's the third grade which I, I forgot the name of um so you <clears throat> you have another thing that is just the um, I don't know the name actually, but it's it's just a mix of different kinds of hmm. uh, leather scraps, basically. That's the, the the last one. Okay. So if we're talking about quality, like, and we don't want to get in the uh, shitty leather, we want mm -hmm. the proper one. How much are we should be like? How much should you be paying for that in a watch strap? Like, what does that kind of start at? Or are um, people conning you still and you're paying a lot, but actually you're still paying for the mix so it, it, yeah it depends uh, some some will some will sell you the, the cheaper um obviously hirsch do not do that obviously no we don't yeah. um for us, it starts, clear. <laughs> for us it starts around um 30 30 euros oh so it's not oh i was thinking like a thousand, a thousand euros or something no no no, no, no 100 euros or something like that no, we, we have a long tradition in, in creating our products and, and that's why we can offer a very reasonable price, a very fair price. But you see a lot of different kinds of brands or um, communities basically offering straps for $100 um, dollars and they're not always made from the highest quality leather mm -hmm. as well. So uh, can, is it fair to say all of your leather is the um, top grain? No, so full grain. It's 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 not, but okay. um Because um, you don't need it. Is it because you don't need it? Because of, if you're using it for you know a watch strap, it needs to be bent, and you probably need longevity over just you know expensive leather. You know the the top grain or the full grain leather has all these qualities. Um, it's very durable as well, and most of the times it it has better qualities actually, mm. um, in terms of wearing comfort because this is one of the most important things as well if you have it on your wrist and you move your wrist constantly um, then you need this comfort as well um, the the lower quality leather has some other features they it it's a bit more it's a bit um, more durable um, but in that sense it doesn't take up um, color and these kinds of things mm as a full grain leather would but i'm not the super expert on leather that's something my brother does a lot because he's doing all the supply chain things and production wise so he knows much more about specifics on leather um, but for us it's our uh, lower priced ranges we do with um, with the other type of leather um, and everything above 30 euros, for example, is all full grain leather. I got mm. that hint of not asking you any more leather questions loud <laughs> and clear. I have a more leather question. So Go you're wearing it. a leather jacket, right? Yeah. So do you have a lot of other leather things at home? Like, do you just say, I want this in leather? Well, are, you, are you trying to say he's a leather guy? <laughs> yeah, and it's like leather pants, leather everything. Um, not really. I used to. I I used to uh, want only wear leather. <laughs> these kinds of things, but now it's it it's solely based on leather jackets. Actually, yeah. So you guys do leather jackets as well? No. All right. <laughs> no. 
<laughs> it would be cool actually because we we have all this uh, know-how and we could do a couple of cool things but it's yeah because i feel it's like a different business field basically and it is it's not that but easy, yeah. if you look at the leather jacket market well from what i'm exposed to in hong kong it's really limited it goes from you have super cheap but the quality is ridiculously bad and then you go super high end there's no in between so then you just either go super high end and in my head it's actually only two brands or you just do mass market yeah so what are the two brands are you thinking you'll be surprised chrome hearts and balman like even yeah, if you look at chanel fendi everything it sucks like it can't oh, even compare man. like why i saw laura piana thing. how about laura piana that i haven't checked yeah right. honestly. alex and me have i'm not gonna say any brand but we've been to those brands on the level you're talking about yeah. not looking at leather but looking at the suits literally <laughs> like picking at the suit going oh you know this hasn't even been canvassed you know they're yeah. charging you this much for it man it's just yeah, just appearing like yeah the it's really like, it's really, a, really bad the apology. total like scam yeah. man you yeah. just don't get any anything i'm not gonna say the brand because yeah. yeah anyway yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah moving on <laughs> Right. You work for the family business now, Nicholas, but it isn't where you started or actually what you originally wanted to do. How did you end up working there? So um, the story goes that I actually always wanted to be in the hotel business. So mm -hmm. I always dreamed of having my own hotel or, or managing my own hotel. Um, I don't know why, but I think it has something to do with growing up in Hong Kong and seeing all these fancy hotels and um, the, the level of hospitality and, and, and high quality service as well. Um, I then had the chance to work in a hotel for quite some time, but um, quickly found out that it's not what I wanted to do. And then I went on a journey finding out my purpose, basically. So I, I started studying um, economics, not, not because I love economics, it's just what was the right thing more or less to do and the only thing I, I could think of. And then I had some, some endeavors, uh, one with my brother where I founded a company with him um, with... Uh, a jewelry brand where we made some uh, leather bracelets basically um, which went quite well in the first two years but then uh, we said okay we'll focus on the university and stop doing that the company still exists but it's n nowhere near what we what we've done um, in the first two years and then I worked a lot in the Hirsch company um, in summer uh, where I uh, traveled with our salespeople in many, many countries. And um, I somehow ended up in the company because of social media. Um, we are very conserv or we were a very conservative company. Um, we didn't have social media. We did not have uh, an online store or anything like that. We solely focused on offline. And uh, during my universities, I, I was exposed to all these um, things. And, and I said, okay, we, we have to do something like that. And so I started building up the social media accounts, um, started um, talking to all the people in the company and telling them we need to do this. So one thing led to another and uh, a couple of years in i was then um, head of marketing and then we we had our um, a big uh, strategy meeting basically where we said okay what does the future of hirsch look like and my brother and me were invited to con to contribute basically because at some point it might be our business um, and from that point on both of us stayed in the company and we found a place. So he's now doing the production side and I'm doing the sales and marketing side. And yeah, that's, that's how I ended up in the company basically or where I am now. So, yeah. Does that mean that you feel like you have found 
your like so-called purpose in life or do you feel like it's still a journey and then you're still finding your place within the company and then maybe five to ten years time you're like wait I actually like research and development or something so it, for me it's still a journey it's not 100% mm -hmm. what I feel is I'm not I'm not fully, fully fulfilled yet yeah yeah okay. um but it's definitely the right field for me. I know that I love the sales side. Um, I'm not particularly the best sales guy, but mm -hmm. I love talking to people, networking with them. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also not that super extroverted. So if you put me in a room with 10 people, I'm probably not going to be the guy that talks to every 10 people. Yeah. Um, um, but you need Alex on your team. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, just let you clear, Nicholas. I'm actually an introvert myself. I just know how to behave like an extrovert. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. You'll have to teach me someday. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I think it's still a journey, and I I love the process. And I don't know where it's going to be in the next couple of years, but I love the company um, just because it it gives me the possibilities to be so creative and try different things. Um, and express myself as well. Very cool. Yeah. Did you have yeah. uh, any at all parental pressure to take over the business? Because you are fourth generation, is that right? Yep. Right. So was there any, did you feel any pressure to take over the company? So there was no particular pressure from from my parents or from my grandfather or, or in that sense but it was always there so i always knew okay if if everything if shit hits the fan basically i can <laughs> always go back to the company mm -hmm. um and, but i always wanted to do something myself and we have a long history in our uh, family where um, all of the people are entrepreneurs and so basically that was something i wanted to achieve as well and um, I don't know, I, I loved seeing how we work with our people, our employees, how we treat them, um, how we do our business basically. And at some point, um, if you're dealing with the watch industry, at some point you'll fall in love with watches. And uh, for me, it was, it was quite interesting because I always was exposed to watches, but never super interested in it but at some point it was there and then i said okay and I, I, I need to experience that yeah when was that moment was it like looking at a watch company or hanging around with different friends there must be something that ticked for you um i think in the in when when i was talking to daniel i uh, i mentioned a couple of things uh, before but I was thinking before I came to the podcast um, what I'm going to say if you guys ask me that. And I'm actually not 100% sure what moment it was, but I was always um, traveling to Basel World. Um, so the last 10 shows, basically, that unfortunately it doesn't exist anymore. But um, And... At some point during these shows, we had the opportunity to, um, we were never allowed into these big um, houses. So we, we never had real access. We had all these meetings and, and did um, our, our stuff there, but we, were n we, we could never see the watches. And at some point we were allowed to see the watches. We had these collections and they were shown to us and, and um, just seeing this enthusiasm of the people that go into there and, and, and the watches and everything, it was just amazing. And at that point I was, I was like caught in this mystery world of the watch industry. And um, I started researching a little bit. I bought my first watch. Um, I actually bought, um, so the real watch, the, the, my first real watch I bought was, a, or it still is, is the Rolex Milgaus. And I actually wanted to buy an Omega Aquaterra. Um, but I don't know why, but I ended up with the Rolex and I did not know anything. I knew that Rolex was super high class and famous and everything, but I did not know 
the hype around the brand. So it was quite fun actually to to um, buy that. Yeah, having gone to Basel World so many years, but then. Mm-hmm. Spending a huge amount of that time not being into watches was it really funny? Like looking at all these like watch fanatics because then you are so out of it, right? So then you see all these people smiling and like going crazy, but then you're just like, I'm just here to get my shit done. Was that really weird? Um, a bit, yeah. yeah. It was a bit weird because I did not understand what these people are doing here and why there are so many people here and yeah. I only got to understand the business, I think, in the last three or four shows um, where I also met up with some journalists and where I got into this eco eco space and everything. And in the beginning, it was super strange, yeah. Um, Do you have any friends around you that um, even, I don't know, when you were 25, starting 25, telling you, wow, you have the best job, like, you are the luckiest person, you're exposed to all the stuff? No. Okay. No, I, I, I have, I, I don't know, the, the friends I, I have um, are very humble themselves. Mm-hmm. And um, I've never had someone say that I'm super lucky to be in this industry. So, <laughs> so did you right. just humbly say that you're quite humble? <laughs> I did yes, actually, did. yeah. <laughs> Um, my next question is you've mentioned that you kind of wanted to start something on your own maybe create your own legacy Uh, now you basically continue somebody else's legacy how does that feel like do you have an itch on your back waiting to that eventually needs to be sorted out where you actually branch off and do your own thing I do actually, yeah. Um, and I'm already doing it a little bit. Yeah. So um, when I started the company with my brother, I I thought that this is going to be a super success. And never first time starting a company, no clue what, I'm, what I was doing. And of course, it didn't go as planned. Um, but now a couple of years older and a bit more, a bit wiser, I, I know more things and I know that I need a good team to do, th- do something similar. Um, but I still have this itch on my back to, to do something on my own. Uh, but I don't feel that um, carry on, cr- carrying on somebody else's legacy is, is a problem or something like that. I really enjoy what I do. And um, I want to stay in the company basically as long as it needs or as long as it gives me pleasure because I want to build up the company um, together with my brother and for the next generations basically. So this is something that I feel is a good thing to do. But then again, I want to do something on my own. And that's why I also do a lot of um, things on the side. I have my own blog. I've started my own podcast as well um, mm. around all these kinds of things. Now I've started a, a kind of blogging show on YouTube. Um, it, it does focus around the watch industry because it's such a big part of um, what I do, but still, uh, I still feel that I need to do more or something different. Okay. So well, uh, to, to go on that point, no, because that, um, you know, you touched on something quite inspirational there, because I don't think there's any um, problems with leaving something better than you found it. So with your family business, I think there's actually quite a lot of um, character and charm. If you can pick up what they gave you and kind of make it even further and build it to something probably even greater still. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. There's a lot of charm in that. Yeah. Yeah. What I've picked up about Nicholas is that he just has a lot of energy in him and he's <laughs> um, like bursting, like he needs a place, an outlet, right? And you're kind of um, exploring all these channels to do that. So I'm excited to see like what comes out of this, like in 20 years time, 30 years time. Yeah. Um, oh, so that's another point I want to make. So me and Dan have some um, friends who have done hospitality um, 
and they have also worked in the hotel. I just want to know what is so bad, like working in a hotel that just like makes everyone like say the same thing, which is like, fucking no, I'm not doing it. <laughs> fucking people that come in walking through the door, people like you and me. I don't know, but at that time when I was working in the hotel, I, I just thought, I, I cannot do that. It, it's so stressful and you have to be there all the time and you have to put in so many hours. And I mean, if I compare it to what I do now, I, I work a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but it, it doesn't feel like work. It's, it's fun. So I don't know. I think it also has to do with a lot of consumer contact. Mm -hmm. um, because if you're, if you're exposed to that a lot, I, mean, I think you get quite frustrated. Yeah. I, I see it now. I, of course, um, the majority is super nice and super uh, understanding, but then you have some people that aren't and these stress you out a little bit. <laughs> So I don't know. I, I, maybe in the future I'll do it again. I, I have no. I have no idea. But it's at the moment it's not for me. All right. I mean, when I was a dentist, I sometimes used to see. I probably averagely see like thirty people a day, and then if it was really busy, probably forty, forty-five people a day. But when the patient comes in, they only think that you saw them that day. Or you only saw like four people that day and every time you work like you are working to the minute right it doesn't look you know the patient never feels like you're working to the minute but you are uh because otherwise you know your schedule because the, the way it works is you know time is money for a dentist so if you have any spare time that spare time that could be made using uh, making money so you try and pack out your and schedule your book really really well so it's one after another so basically the bank balance just keeps coming in um but every time you have to gear yourself up for the next patient every time uh, at the end of the day you are just knackered like mentally you are just so dead uh, and that's actually part of the reason why i started going to the gym because there when i went home there was an imbalance where I was completely mentally drained, but physically I was still quite on it. And so I went to the gym to really drain my body and my mind just so that I could get a good night's sleep. Mm. Um, but I just remember being so tired, and especially when you're not totally fulfilled every day when you wake up and you think another 30 people, another 30 people, eventually it's just too much. And I don't know if you guys know, but dentistry has like, in the UK at least, the second highest suicide rate. Oh. That I didn't know. What's number one? Vets, uh, isn't vets, it? Vets, yeah. I think yeah. it's vets. vets. Yeah, vets. Cause you, yeah, because you have to kill puppies all day long, isn't it? Oh, And yeah. it's quite... It's, yeah. Well, like, put them I can down, see why the suicide rate is high for dentistry is because, because you feel like you're constantly on this treadmill. You're making really good money. And the money just keeps pulling you back to doing it. And then if you don't want to do it, if you go out of society, everybody thinks like, are you dumb? Like you messed up. Mm -hmm. Why are you interviewing for this job? You, you must have messed up. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very hard ladder to come down, you know, because from 15 years old, you're basically getting the top grades, top grades, top grades. And eventually the, the whole mindset change is really difficult for a lot of people. So mm -hmm. they feel they can't get out and that's why the, the rate's so high. But anyway, I'm digressing. But uh, you mentioned that obviously now you're in the business, quite fully integrated in the business. I still believe your father is still part of that in there. It is. Yeah. He is, yeah. So my next question would be, how much autonomy do you have in the running of the company? Like, because like, the reason I think is I feel like a Chinese, right? And that is just a nightmare for me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh my God, like... Go to the company, you have to deal with your mom and dad, then like, or your dad, or your mom. And then you come back home and it's basically more of the same. Because uh, in Chinese culture, there's a lot of respect. I'm not saying there's no respect in other cultures, but there's very high respect on the parent, which sometimes get confused on what the parent says is always right, right? And in a business meeting, it should be who's right is right, right? Who has a valid point is right. 
but in Chinese, it's like, okay, I'm the dad. So what I listen say, to me, yeah, it goes. <laughs> um, how much autonomy do you have? And do you have, and do you have any of these issues? Um, we have a lot of autonomy. So um, in the process, when we joined the company, so when my brother and me joined the company, we, my father always said, you're allowed to do whatever you want. Um, because it was a time where we had a turning point as well in, in terms of a generational shift and all these new technologies and new markets and more digitalization. And this is something he said that we need to um, basically create the future. And it's not his time anymore to create the, the outlook of the company. And that's why he gives us a lot of autonomy. Of course, he's here to, um, to guide us and he gives us advice, but we try our best to talk about um, all these points behind the curtain um, because it's, it's not good if you're sitting in a meeting with five other people and then you start fighting about who's right or wrong. Um, so so these, these kinds of things, they don't usually happen. Is that because um, your grandfather did the same for your father? And secondly, um, when you joined the business, you're operating 80 countries now. Was that also yeah. the case before you joined? Was it less or more? Um, so to answer the second question first, um, yeah. the countries haven't changed basically. Okay. So um, my responsibility is over 80 countries, the service business and the OEM business. But um, both my brother and me have a second person that um, that we work with, um, which is also in charge of the same business field. And they help us and we help them basically to split up, um, split up the work. So, so, so that in, in that sense. And in terms of um, being the same with my grandfather and my father, it wasn't because we had the tradition that um, the, the person in the family who wants to take over the business has to buy the business from the current business owner. So you have to invest heavily in what you want to do. And the experience my father had was a very um, hard one. Um, my grandfather is a, an amazing person, but he's also a strong businessman and he has a very, very distinct um, uh, he, he Idea knows what he wants. philosophy about it. A strong exactly, philosophy yeah. about it. Yeah. yeah. So, so my father had to buy the company from him, which um, was also a huge investment in terms of money and everything and also big risk. And he did not want us to have the same experience. So that's why we have this uh, integrated uh, exchange basically where my brother and me we we start slowly and then we have this guidance from our father and and at some point he will he will leave because he said before we joined the company he said that probably when he turns 60 he he wants to leave he doesn't want to stay in the company for that long um, so he's 58 right now so two more years maybe or three or four whatever he wants to do so if we talk about that integration of you into the company a lot of the people there, I'm assuming, worked under your father, have that loyalty with your father, uh, probably older generation, roughly around the same age, many years with your father. Now you have this young kid coming in, taking over the reins, doing something social media, digital, that they don't really understand. Do you meet resistance? How do you cope with the fact that you are just there because of your name? you wouldn't have been there if it wasn't because of who your father was. How do you deal with that? So it was hard in the beginning because the first time I had, um, when I took over the marketing department, I had some people that did not respect me um, for what I was doing. They, they knew, okay, or they're, they thought I was here just because of my name. Um, but in fact, um, my brother and me, we, we were in the company for all our life. So we know a lot of the people as well, personally. 
Um, we've worked in the production, we've worked in the logistics department. So we started from the bottom basically. Um, so that's not huge of a problem anymore. You will always have to face these kinds of um, situations, I guess. Um, it's just like that in family business. But if you have the experience, if you experience it once where you have these people that resist, um, and then you might need to let them go because they destroy the whole team. Then you learn from these experiences and then you get to cope with them a bit better. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, um, just from my, like my own curiosity, I want to know, um, do you behave differently at work? Because I work in an environment where everyone around me is actually older than me. And I'm actually for lack of a better word, like scared to tell people what to do. So I kind of make up for it by being like very timid, like really scared, dressed down completely. I don't even wear my watches to work. I wear an Apple watch or a G-Shock, right? And I try and be as quiet as possible. So do, is there, um, do you do anything like that? Or are you just like, okay, I just execute what I need to do? Um, so I think you always have to put on a mask in certain situations. I think that's what we humans do. Um, you're never yourself a hundred percent. That's uh, maybe I can put it like that. But what I, what I tend to do is I, I tend to try to be myself. Um, so I'm, um, I'm a very emotional person. So if there's a meeting and I feel that <clears throat> it's going in the wrong direction, I will s say what I'm thinking and I will maybe bit, be a bit emotional about it as well. So I don't have a problem with that. And I, uh, I guess I, when I started, um, I, I, I've shown everyone what it's like to work with me. So I don't do that. in the meeting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, it, but I, I think you learn a lot during the process and, um, I feel that it's very necessary for me to feel myself when I work in the company, because it's such a big part of me and it takes a lot of time, um, that it also contributes to me being happy as well. Mm -hmm. I think um, in terms of doing business, I think what really helped give me a lot of guidance is um, I've learned to be very assertive. So you have to be very, you know, determined and believe in what you have. And the second thing is you have to be good with people. Um, the whole team and the environment around you has to be good and you have to be good at analytics. So someone like me who's in a rainmaking position or someone who does business, those are three, uh, three things I always tell myself. And that's how you kind of go across the line. Um, and I think that's something that you, you probably understand and develop as you're doing your business. Yeah, um, you, you have to. So what I've learned from, from people that are a lot wiser than me um, is that you have to observe a lot. And I, I tend to do that um, very much, much more than in the beginning, because uh, in the beginning, it was more emotion, and now it's more taking a critical step. Critical thinking, back. yeah, critical yeah. thinking and logical, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not that good with analytics, so that's that's more my my brother's better than me in that. But I totally agree in what you said. Yeah. Is this interview going the way you thought it would go? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not, right? <laughs> um, a little bit, yeah, <laughs> but a little <laughs> different actually as well. But it's that's totally fine. But, um, what did you prep him? I still got some other stuff, man. I think we can <laughs> eventually get to straps. But um, sorry, yeah. <laughs> I think we are talking about something which is basically how do you get respect. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually think it's a very complicated answer. I mean, we're trying to really paraphrase it and generalize, but it is very, very hard, especially once you factor in being a leader as well it and the age age group thing it, it's very difficult to to say but 
Anyway, well, it helps when you mentioned you went from like the ground up, like you started right at the bottom, then you worked your way up. I think that's the best way. Well, to I think that's that. one factor where people have to recognize your ability. Like yeah. if they don't rate you, it's pretty hard to respect you. Yeah. I think as a leader with your communication has to be clear and concise because people don't really, a lot, a lot, a lot is lost in communication. So if you're, if your orders aren't very clear, uh, it's probably your fault, right? And then someone yeah. does the wrong thing. Um, and then also we touched on being calm, right? If somebody's a loose cannon and really over the place, the person doesn't feel at ease operating at their best under that person. Yeah. So they have to be level-headed all the time. So when everybody is losing their head, they have that ability to stay calm. I think that generalizes everything yeah, you just said. Good point. Right. So, right. I lost where I am now on my questions. <laughs> With straps. You said something about straps. No, no, we're not on there yet. <laughs> we're not on there yet. Um, what, I've, what I've picked up in this interview is that there must be a very successful, strong culture at your company to make you go through four generations and I'm talking to you and I almost feel like I feel what that culture is because you are very humble. Yeah, you, you came across like that in the first interview where I had with you privately, very humble. Um, but like Long Long said, I also feel incredible steel in you, right? And I feel that is must be kind of very parental, like how pe your parenting. And I wonder whether that culture all throughout has made, because a lot of companies in, in, in Chinese, right? We have a phrase is which mm -hmm. means that the wealth never goes past three generations. Mm -hmm. You're in the fourth generation, very successfully. What I'm guessing I'm trying to ask is, what is the success of passing on wealth through generations? Apart from going through Alex Lau. <laughs> Great question. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, I, I actually <laughs> don't know. I, I actually don't know. Um, I think I think it involves a lot of persistence as well. Um, um, and um, I'm I'm very fortunate enough to be in a business where um, we've learned a lot in the past few years, and we've um, we've worked on our craft, and we belong to a group of people that are very few experts in this field. Um, I think that's one of the most important points, and I think. An additional one is that um, you have this general mentality in the family that uh, at some point you're going to be successful in, in terms of becoming an entrepreneur because everyone else was an entrepreneur, so it can't be that difficult to do. And you have a lot of experience as well from, you can ask all these people that have done it already or have been there already. Um, so. I think, I think these things contribute to it, but actually I have no clue how to answer the question because uh, I am not there yet. I mean, if I can pass down the company to the next generation, um, maybe then I will learn um, what it's like, but now I actually don't know. Okay. I want to know within your own family, what is the biggest, uh, like, what is the bigger sin? being lazy or uh, not even having the drive to want to start a business? What is worse in your family? Um, none of these actually. The, okay. the, the thing we, we want or the, the worst thing to do is to start something and not finish it. Okay. Okay. Um, so this is something we stand for. If we do something, we, we finish it. Mm -hmm. oh, I and love that. It, it's necessary because you also train yourself that you have to complete things, um, even if you don't want to, and even if they don't make sense. I've, uh, I had a hard time studying, for example. I, mm. I, it took me 10 years to finish my bachelor's degree. I hated wow. it. Wow. 
but uh, in the end, you always have it on your back. You, you have to finish it because if it's done, it's done. Mm -hmm. So, so I think that's, that's, yeah. So we're soon going to expect the Hirsch hotels at some point then. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I don't, I but haven't had it on my radar. Actually allow you free everything just because we're friends for like, I don't know, an hour now. Can we have, mm -hmm. if you ever have one of those hotels, we have one of those cars that give us free everything. Like free <laughs> massage, free spa, free deluxe room, as long as, uh, no, free penthouse, as long as it's available, free food. That's very, very important. Mm. Can you promise that now on record that you will do that for us? I, uh, I can't promise it, but <laughs> we, can, we, can, we can talk about it in, if we're still friends then and if, if it actually like we're not friends anymore, Daniel. Uh, You'll get the hotel, uh, go, Daniel, we're not friends anymore, by the way. It's like But I think one thing that I talked about the success going down from generation to generation. But one thing that you mentioned before and you, we didn't highlight there is that you also have two brothers. So that wealth then has to be distributed into three people, uh, potentially. That would be a nightmare scenario for a lot of Chinese, I'm telling you. Yeah. Right. Because they're three boys, right? Yeah. It's not even one boy and two girls. Yeah. So how does your family approach that? And then just commenting on what you said before, how you don't know why the success is. Maybe that's the magic of good parenting. Like you don't see the answer yet. They gave you free reign to do stuff, but when the time comes, they didn't teach you the answer, you learn it yourself. Right. Mm. So maybe that's the magic. Maybe. Um, having two brothers is a, is a challenge. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm the oldest and the oldest. And um, I, I know it, it is a challenge. I can tell you that. Um, but Every, every person is different and every person has a different goal in life. So it doesn't have to be that we need to take over the business together, three boys. Um, but I know, for example, my, my younger brother that is in the company with me, um, we we're only a year apart. And um, so we're very close. So three so boys in two years. So it's literally one after the other, basically. No, no, no. The youngest is, uh, we're, we're, he's six years younger than me. So. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Okay. 24 or turning 24. Yeah. He should be quite relatively easy to cut out then. <laughs> <laughs> he has a different goal in life. His goal in life is to earn a lot of money. And he knows that he will not, or he, he says he won't be able to do it in our company. So he has to do something different. Wow. Respect. Wow. respect for him. No, respect so for him. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So he just founded his own company. Um, we'll see what happens. Um, but it's fun. <laughs> is that why? I, it doesn't say, <laughs> is that competition? Are you going to help him out at some point? No, no, no. I, I, he can always ask me. I'll, I'll be happy okay. to help him out. Good, good. Hey, but, um, but yeah, to, yeah. to finish off the question you asked, Daniel, um, I think... Um, definitely it's hard, but, um, if you have a good enough relation, uh, if your relationship is good enough, um, then I think there's always a possibility to work out things. And in our company, we've always had this, this tradition that, um, at some point every child or every person would have a stable financial income. So my grandfather always looked that every one of his kids would get a company that works well. So out of the small company we have, we've created different other companies that are now um, working on their own and working in different kinds of fields and, and these things. So That's everything's very possible. Very smart, yeah. Very well, well planned. That actually finishes the family stuff. and Because uh, I, I thought... Every time I do a podcast, I try and find a particular angle of that person. And I thought that was a particularly interesting angle that not many people, not many guests we have, have that. So it was interesting to hear the dynamics of that. But we'll go on to some strap questions now. Do you think that the ladies market is an area of growth for what straps? Because I feel like 
even with forget the watch straps i think even watches is a very not i don't want to say like underdeveloped but i just feel like it could be better and you could get more women into it um i think in one of your previous episodes you've talked about this already i think um that the ladies market is not really um suited for actual ladies so i i totally agree i think um I think that it needs to it needs to change a little bit. I do have I do see a lot of potentials for watch straps, um, just because um, women are more um, how do I say more fashionable than men. Um, they like to accessorize, and so I think there's there's more potential in in doing things like in in in, in terms of watch straps. And also in terms of watches as well, uh, if you think about potential dial colors or, or these these types of things. Um, but yeah, it's okay. it's strange that there there's not that much. Um, how does how do I put it? It's it's strange that it's not that geared to to ladies as much as you would expect. Right. One thing I think we definitely have to ask you on this podcast is how do you even make a strap? Like, how do you critique a strap? Instead of looking at the price, can you teach us this is a good strap, this is what you need to look for, this is how it's made to... This density it. and all that sort of stuff, right? Yeah, or well, just like as a consumer, because I think a lot of consumers, they just look at color and price. So the... First thing you you will see is definitely the material, um, and I think that from your point of view, you can distinguish between a cheap material and a more expensive material. Uh, it's similar to to polishing uh, of movements or the polished steel or these kinds of things. Um, and then one of the most important parts is what's inside of the. Um, the, the leather strap mm. because some companies put in um what is that called is there a padding. term for that padding yeah it's, okay. it's it's called the padding basically so if you the the thickness and everything um and we we for example we use leather inside as well because what what this does is it allows us to have this the same materials on the top layer, the bottom layer, and the inside, which means that the the air, the moisture, and everything that can have a constant flow, it doesn't doesn't get stuck anywhere. And with with some companies, you have um, materials that soak up the the moisture, for example, and then the um, the strap starts smelling bad, or it starts discoloring, or any type of changes that they will happen then and then there's one huge misconception in the the, the leather watch straps uh, ecosphere is that you will need to clean it at some point so what i always say is clean your watch strap every once a month for example just wash it under lukewarm water and that's it. You don't have to do anything else and let it, let it dry. And then it will look, um, it will last longer. Of course, for some materials, it's not a good idea. You might need something different. For example, for the um, suede materials, you take a brush and brush it off a little bit. Um, but that normally, uh, you can take some, some water. It's, it's okay. And how do you care for the uh, exotics like alligator straps? I do the same thing. So we also recommend for our straps to do the same thing. Of course, if you have the shiny alligators, um, they have a, a certain finish. Coating, that, yeah. Yeah, they have a, exactly, they have a coating that should not get wet. So for that, it's a bit difficult, but what you can do there is you can use a, a small damp cloth and just clean the bottom side of um, the, the strap and then, um, and then that's okay as well. Which actually are the hardest straps to make? Um, the hardest straps to make are definitely the, the black, shiny 
alligator straps because the the shiny alligator material is very hard and so it's very difficult to um to work with it and then you have you have one huge um thing you need to care about is the the shiny alligator is very um sensitive so if if it gets bent or anything, you will see the, the yeah, mark yeah, yeah. instantly. And yeah. so you have to be very careful and you need experts who know what they're doing um, to cut the material and then to, uh, yeah, to, to make the strap basically. Okay. Uh, like, are there any differences between, let's say your straps and like a Jean Rousseau straps? Or is it just basically, because you're, like, John who? Hey. That's what he's thinking. Who's John, John what? <laughs> but I mean, like, um, because I'm just thinking, is it that hard to make such a good strap? And then once the, once the know-how has been done, is it just a difference in brand name and branding? And they're actually pretty much the same product. It's not really, because um, every strap maker has their own um, process in, in, in creating the product. So um, over time, different kinds of um, manufacturing ways have developed. So you, you will see, for example, there are, there are straps that are, um, that are folded in. You have these, um, you, have them, you have them cut where you have the cut edges, where you have the lacquer or, or mm -hmm. these kinds of things on. And then you have, what we do is we call it our Hirsch uh, Rambordé. Um, what we do is we we place the upper material on the sides, so you have so you have like a, a, a seamless integration mm -hmm. of the bottom and the upper side of the material, which in fact gives us the opportunity to seal the edges as well with the material, and this makes us a bit different than other make, uh, other strap makers because they don't do that. And what we need for it is, um, or what the benefit of it is, it gives us a lot of precision as well and high quality. So um, the bracelets last longer. Um, and then um, what we need to do is we need a lot of tools to do that because we need the precision, precision and we need like the, the, the sealing process to be exact. Otherwise you will have parts of the leather standing out or it might be a bit too short so this is this has to be perfect so this is something that differentiates us from from other strap makers we need tooling to be precise and have this high quality and um, others for example they they make it by hand completely um, we have a lot of hand um, how do you say it? yeah we have a lot of people that work on the strap as well um, by hand but some processes need to be with with tools and if you think about one of our straps need from 60 to 80 different kinds of uh, steps to finish them wow. um then yeah there's well, since you're in charge of marketing i think you <laughs> should like somehow try and find a way of telling the consumer like what is your because i don't really know like and I'm, I'm a watch guy right and i don't even know so if i don't even know then there must be a lot of people that don't know. And there's, the thing is the prices of straps these days range from so cheap to very expensive. It's very hard for the consumer to make a, a judgment. decision. Yeah, judgment. So if I knew more about your strap, uh, I would probably yeah, be justified to pay more for your strap. I just don't think the consumer is well informed. Yeah, you should do a video from the the process from start to finish, and then you just get to watch this fifty minute video of how you guys do it. I think that'd be quite a good one. Yeah, right. yeah, definitely, totally agree. <laughs> right, that went really quick. I'm actually on my last question now. What opportunities are left in the what strap business? Daniel wants to get in, so he wants to know the hints. <laughs> I won't get in, but you know, <laughs> I'll partner up with you if I think you're good enough. <laughs> Um, so we see a lot of potential in making it easier for the consumer to change, um, their strap. Um, so this is something very important. I think that it will become more 
than in the next couple of years. And you will, see, I think what we see right now with the whole um, shift to more personalized products, um, more, um, more colors, um, more different variants, and also um, brands tapping into the field of custom making things, um, we will see the need for um, this, this kind of mechanisms. And what we want to do is we just want to make it easier for the consumer, basically. We want to have the best product, and this is our main goal. Um, and it's not always easy to have the best product, but uh, you have to be very, uh, you have to think a lot of steps um, into the future. And I think in, in, terms of, um, in terms of colors, in terms of different kinds of materials, as I said in the beginning, um, we're looking for materials that are not only recycled, um, but are actually sustainable or actually giving a benefit. So we're looking more in, 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 in the field of plants um, and, and these kinds of things. If we can, I don't know, I'm, I'm, if we can create uh, um, a forest, for example, and collect the leaves in, in winter or in, in, in fall and repurpose those leaves, um, then uh, that's amazing. And then we can plant more of these trees and, and these kinds of things. So this is something we're looking at and we'll see what happens in the future. When you make a decision in a company, how long does it take for that idea to come to fruition? How far are you predicting ahead a trend? So or a we're working trend? around one to two years ahead okay. right now. Um, wow. So for example, I, I, maybe I have, you have seen it on my, on my Instagram, but we have, we have the, these products that are made out of caoutchouc and leather. And we've introduced this product in, uh, I think, 2015. And um, only now the watch brands are actually working with it. So you've had Hublot that has done these types of um, fusions between two materials in the past, but other mainstream brands are just now tapping into this field. So if you, yeah, it's five years ago. So. Um, oh, okay. So potentially who is one of your clients. Hmm. All right. <laughs> right. Anyway, thank you, Nicholas, for being such a good sport and agreeing to do this interview. Um, yeah, as I mentioned before, I love your humble humbleness and manners. You know, every time I've dealt with you, you've, you've been great. You know, I mean, I feel like I come across as pretty brash and unrefined. And I feel like despite me being older than you, maybe it's a little bit embarrassing. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> let's move on to the quick fire. Are you ready? But before we, we get into the quick fire, I'd like to say thank you to you guys. Um, and, thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I'd like to support what you're doing. I really enjoy what, what, you, what you're doing. And um, I'd like to um, have you guys give, give something back to your community. And to, to do that, I'd like to offer you a couple of our watch straps to do so. Oh, oh that's okay. really sweet. Great. <laughs> so, so they're not, not actually for me then. <laughs> yeah. I, actually, no, I was just going to say, I was like, I actually wanted them for myself. But anyway, <laughs> thanks for the, thanks for the uh, generosity, Nicholas. You're all welcome. Right. So I guess what we can do oh. is for all the listeners listening out there, uh, if you could repost anything that has to do anything with the waiting list podcast on your Instagram stories and tag us on it so we know. Uh, we will look to um, pull a name out of a hat within two weeks of the podcast of this episode of the podcast being released, and we'll pick a winner at random. Uh, how many straps are there? So how many do we have to pick up? <laughs> Maybe we can do ten. Okay, Whoa, so that's a lot. <laughs> we'll keep six for ourselves and give away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, that's very. Generous. But well, no, we will. Uh, we'll, we'll pull out them out, and then we'll talk to Nicholas. Thank you very much. Nicholas, for such a, a generous gesture. It's in line Thank with you. exactly how I thought you, you are. Uh, so, yeah. Right, here we go, then oh. the quick fire. Vienna or Hong Kong? Hong Kong. Wow. Oh. Wow. <laughs> nice. nice. Um, best watch in your mind that is the best for accessorizing straps with? The Rolex Submariner. Okay. I would say the uh, no date. 
the speedy missile. Ah, yeah. It's a good one as well. Yeah, it's a good one. Right. Pin buckle or deployant? Uh, pin buckle. Nice. Yeah. Um, first place you will travel when the borders open? Uh, Hong Kong. <laughs> You're just saying all the politically right questions, the answers, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Hong Kong or Japan. I'd love to well, go back to Tokyo, but um, to I'd go to Hong Kong first. Let's say Shanghai, right? Next question. Never been to Are Shanghai, you... actually. You need to come then. <laughs> right. We'll make it happen. Yeah, bring your hotel over here. Yeah. <laughs> right. Are you subscribed to the waiting list podcast? Yes. How long for? Uh, since day one, actually. Whoa. Oh, Whoa. Whoa. Yeah, Impressive. I've heard every episode. Yeah. Wow. wow. That's my next question. Thank you for supporting us. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Which is your favorite episode? That's a hard one. There are so many good ones. Um, I'd li I like the episode with uh, Yu Long Long. Oh, and yeah. uh, I like the last episode with Austin as well. But um, yeah, there are so many good ones. What is it? All of them are very good. You choose your part. You choose your interviewees very good. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. He's talking about himself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel honored. <laughs> um, what's the best strap and watch combo you've ever seen? Because huh. I, I like one. what I like what Richard Mill is doing with the stretch. Um, stretch material and their cases and, and their, their movements and everything. Agreed. Okay. Of course you would, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you what strap I thought. Like, I wouldn't buy that watch and I wouldn't, I just wouldn't even buy it with that strap. But when I saw it, I was like, Whoa. It actually works. It works so well. Yeah. Which is Mark Cho's Cartier Santos on the black Stingray strap. Ah, yeah, that's cool, yeah. I right. can imagine that. I that's was cool, like, yeah. damn, it, that so works. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it made me actually look at the watch. Like, made me think, shall I get that watch? Because the strap just elevated that watch to a, a different level. Have you seen that strap, uh, that, no. that watch combo, no. um, Alex? No, I haven't seen it. I know the Black Stingray, though. I think I've, I've seen yeah, it other amazing. watches. Yeah, it's cool, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it's cool. The it's way it goes of... with the tank. Yeah, the, the, like the mother the of pearl sort of shine. Yeah. It's like pebbles, isn't it? It looks like pebbles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, which straps to avoid? Anyone else apart from Hirsch, basically. <laughs> um, black and brown ones. Okay, mm. yeah, yeah. So the majority used by the Swiss watch industry. <laughs> <laughs> I like cool. colors, so I prefer right. colorful straps. Next one. Tell us one myth about watch straps. One myth um, that uh, they are they should not be in contact with water. Okay, right. And the last one, what's the first thing you do when you wake up? I look at my phone. <laughs> Is that for emails? Uh, emails, DMs, all these kinds of things. Unfortunately. <laughs> right. right. Well, that ends the podcast. Thank you for listening. And remember to subscribe and comment if you liked it. Thank you again, Nicholas. And thank yeah, you to my co-host, so Alex. And Long Long. Well, thanks. No, thank you, Nicholas. It was really good to have you on. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We have a much deeper appreciation of straps now. Yes, mm -hmm. I definitely do. <laughs> so our thank audience, you, yeah. we'll see you on the next one. See ya. Bye. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you for tuning in to the Waiting List podcast. Hit the subscribe button and the next episode will come straight to your phone as soon as it's ready. Whilst I'm here, please remember to leave a nice review and follow us on Instagram at the Waiting List Podcast.